the the hardest decision to make is how you start. Uh, in America, you begin with a joke. Uh, in Asia, you begin with an apology. So what I do, I combine the two traditions and I apologize for my bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my bad joke is actually a, a, a true story. Uh, many years ago, when I was um, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is like the CEO of the ministry, one of my colleagues in another ministry, uh, Mr. Tan, uh, went to China. So when he arrived in China, he called on his uh, counterpart, uh, vice minister, and he introduced himself in English and said, I'm Mr. Tan and I'm the uh, permanent secretary uh, of this ministry. So there's a young Chinese lady translator there. She looked very puzzled and she was trying to figure out how do you translate permanent secretary into Chinese. Then she finally said, oh, this guy says he's Mr. Tan and he says that he's the eternal typist from Singapore. <laughs> so permanent secretary became eternal typist in Chinese. Now I begin with that story actually for a deliberate reason, because if you can have cultural misunderstanding between Singapore, which is 75% Chinese, and China, which is 100% Chinese, you, have reali you realize you have problems in our hand. And that's, in a sense, some, some of what I'm going to be talking about today, about some of the major uh, misunderstandings uh, uh, in the world that are emerging. But, but don't worry, uh, I'll try to end with good news, so don't, don't, don't worry too much. So this is what I propose to do. The question I've been posed is, uh, what is international diplomacy? And I propose to answer the question in, two, in three parts. Firstly, what is the international context today, exactly? Secondly, the question I'll answer is, what is diplomacy? Uh, and thirdly, uh, I'll talk about what we should do, or rather more accurately, what you should do. Right? I'm, I'm already 70 years old, so I've had a good life. <laughs> the question is whether or not all of you will have, in the next 40 to 50 years, when you become 70, will you have a good life or not? So that's what I hope to address, how you can create a better lives for yourself or so. So let me, let me begin by talking and addressing the question, what is the international context? And this is actually surprising, in theory is an easy question to answer, but in practice it's very difficult because you can make the case that we live in the best of times and you can make the case that we live in the worst of times. So this is the paradoxical uh, world that we live in. So let me begin by talking how we live uh, in the best of times. And I'm going to mention, by the way, I did, I'll just show it to you. I did come out with a very short book. Uh, I want to show it to you so you can read it in one hour. <laughs> it's called Has the West Lost It? And in this book, surprisingly, uh, there is a lot of good news in the book. Let me give you three examples. Now, since human history began, the one thing that all societies worried about was that would they go to war? Would, be, would lives be lost in wars? And it was, a, it was a case, by the way, in the 20th century, for example, the biggest wars were fought. And if you were living in a world this is now 2019. If you were living in 1919, a hundred years ago, you'd have just come out with, through one of the most devastating wars, World War I, where millions and millions of people were killed. So the question obviously is, do we face the danger of millions and millions of people dying in interstate wars? Now, here is the good news. Your chances of dying in an interstate war are practically zero. Major interstate wars have become a sunset industry. 
right? And if you want proof, there's a Harvard professor whom I quote in my book, Steven Pinker. Uh, he's written two books, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now. He gives you data that shows maybe in the 1950s, uh, people, 65,000, maybe 70,000 people were dying in interstate wars. Now it's less than a couple of thousand people dying in interstate wars. So that's one piece of good news. And indeed, anyone who was living in 1919, and if he was, uh, came alive in 2019, he said, this is heaven. Nobody's dying in wars. That's an amazing improvement in the world. Now, the second way in which the world has improved is that in 1950, right, which is not too long ago, about two years after I was born, 75% of the world lived in extreme poverty. By the way, including uh, me too. And in fact, I was uh, uh, I killed, I was Singapore's per capita income in the 1950s was the same as Ghana, about $500. And uh, when I went to school at the age of six, I was put on a special feeding program because I was technically undernourished. Now you can see I'm overnourished. <laughs> so uh, that's the world that was in 1950. Today, less than 10% of the world's population lives in extreme poverty. And by 2030, the National Intelligence Council of the United States has predicted that it'll come down to probably zero. Now I can tell you this. Huh? Development economists were thinking for decades, how do we eliminate poverty? How do we eliminate poverty? Uh, people thought it couldn't be done, you know. But the remarkable thing that it has been done, and when I was the ambassador to the UN in the year 2000 and we established the Millennium Development Goals, one of the Millennium Development Goals was to halve global poverty by 2015, and we exceeded it, exceeded that goal. So that's another way in which the world has become better. And then if you look at another indicator of how much the world has progressed, and you look at the global middle class populations, now I want to emphasize one factor. For most of human history, going back thousands of years, the number of people who would enjoy the kind of comfortable lifestyle that all of you are enjoying would be less than 1% of the population, right? Very tiny. Most people led very hard lives and their life expectancy was 30, 40 years old, you know. But today, the global middle class population is already 1.8 billion out of 7.5 billion. By 2020, it's going to hit 3.2 billion. And by 2030, it will be 4.9 billion. So more than half the world's population is going to enjoy uh, global middle class living standards. And believe me, any future historian looking back at human history over the past 30 years would say that the past 30 years of human history have been better than the past 300 years or the past 3,000 years of human history. Quite remarkable. We live in remarkable times. And the question, of course, is why this is happening, and then I discuss that also uh, in my book, and I speak about it, and it's, it's about what I call, one, one of the things, of course, as you know, the, worst, the first civilization to succeed was Western civilization, through the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution. Initially, the West used the power, the colonized to dominate the world, but after that, it shared the gifts of Western wisdom with the rest of the world, and, and over time, the spread of what I call the gifts of Western wisdom have improved the world dramatically. And, and, and again, there have been many what I call silent revolutions, um, like for example, the spread of good governance throughout the world, governments around the world, in all your countries are building things like roads, bridges, ports, hospitals, schools. So there's a progressive improvement in the human condition uh, as a result of uh, the spread of uh, what I call some Western ideas, and the world is getting better and better. So you can see you should all be happy and celebrating and say, hey, we live in the best of times. So now let me give you some bad news. <laughs> Why do we live 
in the worst of times. We live in the worst of times because we are actually going to face some very serious challenges, both on the geopolitical front and on the domestic front. Again, I'll give you three examples again. On the geopolitical front, uh, I can assure you for sure that in the next 10 years at least, you'll be obsessed between the, com uh, uh, between in the competition, the comp uh, obsessed with the competition between the, the world's number one power today, which is the United States of America, and the world's number one emerging power, which is China. And that will be, in one way or another, will affect all your lives, no matter where you are. And I, and I, and I can say that with some confidence, because one of the reasons why you, you might notice I'm looking very relaxed today is because I sent off my 88,000 word manuscript to my publisher in New York. Uh, it's a book on US-China relations. It'll be coming out in spring next year. Please Google and buy it right away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, even before it goes to print. <laughs> Political front is going to be played out in the military front, is going to be played out in the cultural front, and also in what I call the primacy front. So it's a multi-dimensional struggle that is about to break out between the United States and China. And you'll find that countries will have to choose. I'll give you a very simple example. You're, you're all... So far, you notice I've been very good. I haven't mentioned President Donald Trump once. <laughs> I will be mentioning him later. But just to illustrate to you that this has nothing to do with Trump, even when the United States had a very reasonable, kind, peaceful president like Barack Obama, right? Surely you'll agree he's a very nice guy. But even in his time, when China decided to create something called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. And Asia, by the way, needs an infrastructure bank because Asia has got to spend trillions of dollars on infrastructure. China agrees to set up a bank to help Asians build infrastructure. And because China proposes, United States opposes. And sure enough, all the countries got a phone call saying, don't join. Don't join. Very dangerous. Chinese bank, don't join. And sure enough, uh, Australia didn't join. Japan didn't join. South Korea didn't join. But surprisingly, almost all the other Asian countries joined. And even uh, the best friend of United States, well, best friend until last week, was United Kingdom. <laughs> uh, United Kingdom... Uh, joined also and so that was a sign of what that's the kind of trouble that you get uh, when when con when a competition breaks out between the United States and China and more and more countries will have to make more and more painful decisions on more and more subjects as the conflict or that uh, as, as, as a competition uh, builds up so that's one one clearly one major geopolitical tension that we have to learn to live with. The second one is more delicate, and it's a bit harder to speak about because it's uh, politically incorrect. But there is also, as you know, some kind of geopolitical fall line between the West and the Islamic world, right? And it's, of course, as you know, there have been all kinds of wars uh, in so many Islamic countries that have been going on for the last two decades, especially since 9-11 happened in New York in 2001. And I actually know the impact of 9-11 because I was in Manhattan uh, when 9-11 happened, and I know the shock and pain and grief that the American people felt and as a result of the shock and the pain and grief, the uh, United States reacted angrily. And first it launched a war in Afghanistan. And that war in Afghanistan is considered under international law legitimate because the United Nations Security Council endorsed and said, yes, 
United States has a right to retaliate when it is attacked, and so he invaded Afghanistan. But then two years later, the United States invaded Iraq, and that war is considered illegitimate because the United Nations Security Council did not endorse that war. In fact, it was my good friend, uh, who sadly passed away, Kofi Annan, who bravely said that the Iraq war is illegal, for which he suffered a great deal, but he told the truth. So, but that's, that's just two examples, and since then there have been many other wars also between the West and the Islamic world. And this is another fall line. So I hope in the, in the Q&A period you can ask me some questions on these issues and I'm happy to discuss them. My only request is please try to think of the most difficult question. Because I find the, the more difficult the question, the easier the answer. The easier the question, the harder to answer. It's a, it's a real paradox. So I actually would prefer you to come out openly and speak about what's on your mind. Now, so far, the two challenges I've spoken about are the geopolitical challenges, but there's also a third challenge, uh, which I also actually discuss in my book, Has the West Lost It? And the reason why I chose that title is that what is very puzzling is that the most successful civilization, as I said earlier, has been the West, and the West has always led the world in many ways uh, for the last 200 years. Now what's surprising is that it is Western societies that are not progressing, but regressing. And what do I mean by regressing? I mean that they are electing populist governments. Governments that are, in a sense, instead of working to create international programs that work with the rest of the world, they are creating programs that work against the rest of the world. And this is where, of course, uh, President Donald Trump comes in, because he actually believes that the entire, all the institutions of global governance, all the multilateral institutions that were gifts from the West to the rest after World War II, he sees them as being anti-American. So in one way or another, he's attacking every international institution. He's also attacking fundamental principles of global governance, like free trade is good for everybody. He is imposing tariffs. And what's interesting is that he's not just imposing tariffs on uh, China. He's imposing tariffs on uh, the two best friends the United States has, Canada and Mexico, and also on Europe and on Japan. You know, and uh, I, I just met someone uh, who had a conversation with uh, Gary Cohn. Gary Cohn is a former chairman of the National uh, Economic Advisors Council, I think it's called. And one day Gary Cohn sat down with Donald Trump and tried to explain to him uh, what, you, what you call Economics 101. Economics 101 teaches you that tariffs is bad because you know that's how you get the Great Depression and you should actually minimize the use of tariffs and you should encourage free trade. That's Economics 101. So after he explained that to President Trump, President Trump said, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna change, I'm gonna. So Gary Cohn asked him, why, 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 why are you doing this? And Donald Trump replied, I like tariffs. He just enjoys it. It's a weapon, he uses it, and he uses it, I must say, indiscriminately. And of course, if this carries on, then frankly, there is a danger uh, for the world. And what's surprising is that you, we, we thought we only had one populist leader to deal with. In a few weeks' time, we may have another populist leader to deal with who might actually outshine President Donald Trump, and his name is Boris Johnson. <laughs> and you know, if you had told me even 10 years ago, that United States would elect Donald Trump and UK would elect Boris Johnson, I would have said no way. But it's a different world. You can see that's coming. So we can maybe in the Q&A talk about why this is happening. So that's the international context.